my dear professor Paul Mendes Flor, uh, a pleasure to meet with you again. Our first uh, personal meeting was uh, oh, many years ago in, in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, at uh, the Seminario Rabinico Latinoamericano. And uh, in order to introduce you to all the people that uh, will see this uh, recording, uh, I would like to say that um, I like uh, Buber's way of thinking, um, Buber's uh, thoughts, philosophy, uh, since uh, uh, I was at the beginning of my 20s when I studied at the a school, a high school for a Jewish um, education in Argentina named Hamid Rasha Ivrit. Uh, and I had a very good teacher for a Jewish thought. Let us remember his name, Professor Chaim Barilko. And for one semester, uh, we studied Buber. We tried mm -hmm. to understand Buber. Afterwards, as I was caught by the idea of dialogue developed in, in Buber in such a great way, um, uh, I began uh, looking for bibliography about Buber. So mm -hmm. I understood that first and foremost, there are two persons for me uh, that can help me through the work that they develop uh, to search about Buber, to understand him, to, to have material, special material about Buber. One was one of your teachers, Nahum Glaser. Glatzer. 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 And the, at the Brandeis University. And the other one are you, my dear, my dear Paul. <laughs> and the Buber really opened my mind in a very special way because uh, I discovered the power of dialogue. Um, in order to complete uh, um, uh, to complete the details, who is for me, how I feel, and I suppose for many, for many others, Professor Mendes Flor, I would like to uh, to say that you are emeritus, a professor of modern Jewish history and thought from Chicago University and uh, from the Hebrew University. But what is very important regarding dialogue is that you were the culture with the Kadi of Jerusalem of Jewish Muslim dialogue seminar in the, in the 90s and served as chair of Jerusalem Interfaith Rainbow Society. So uh, for me, dialogue was very important. Uh, as a rabbi, I developed uh, the activities uh, um, of uh, the rabbinical seminary uh, in Buenos Aires. I served the rabbinical seminary for 20 years as director of it. Um, uh, as well as I developed uh, the activities uh, in um, B'nai Tikva, a congregation uh, in Buenos Aires, but a special area that I developed was uh, the interfaith dialogue. And God blessed me, and I suppose also <laughs> Pope Francis, that he put us together in this work. And uh, we did uh, many things. We wrote a book together, translated in many languages. Uh, 
also in Hebrew, and uh, and many, many other things. And we are in contact and in dialogue as friends, as friends, mm-hmm. uh, until this very day. So my question is, what is going on in this world regarding our dialogical capabilities? Uh, you are a person, of, I see you as a person with the right to say, according all what I studied and according all what I understood from Martin Buber, uh, what Buber would say in this moment. It's very difficult, but you can, we are talking about art, artificial intelligence. So if you put into, into a, a, a special computer all kind of data, so you can, you can imagine what a, a Buber would say, but, but you are much more than a computer. You have a brain similar to a computer because we have very, very similar structures in our brain as a computer, but you have also a heart. A computer has a heart. Meanwhile, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> what occurs? What occurs? Yes. The dialogue in this yeah. dramatic moment. If I can evoke uh, the voice of Uber's youth, uh, Although he wrote in German, and he's often perceived as a as a German Jew, as a representative of high German culture, especially in terms of his spiritual inflections, he's actually an East European Jew in terms of his education, and his mother language was Yiddish. So he would actually say, and he would say in Yiddish, Oy vey. <laughs> 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 We got in the, the current <laughs> reality, the current world where dialogue is really eclipsed by adversarial, conflictual uh, uh, relations. Uh, here in Israel, of course, at the moment, we're engaged in a, a very difficult war, but it's only one chapter in a, that unfortunately, as I see it, and I certainly as Bubi had, um, an unfortunate series of inability or refusal to for Jews to see the, the reality of Palestinians and Palestinian Christians and, and Muslims for the most part to see the spiritual and existential reality of the Jews. We just try to avoid one another in order not to uh, accommodate the reality of each other in the land that we are destined to share. Um, Many years ago, um, Martin Buber's son, um, who was really hardly an academic, he was a very fine and cultured individual, but he was uh, destined to be an agronomist. Uh, working with agricultural tools and such. But when his father passed away, he was responsible for his father's writings. And he said, I didn't really understand his father's his, my father's writings, but what I really appreciated is my father's ongoing engagement, engagement in Arab-Jewish efforts of Arab-Jewish understanding. And he, he was told that there was a young man who <laughs> perhaps could help him gather his father's writings on these issues, and he came to me, and we produced a book called uh, A Land of Two Peoples, Buber's writings over many, many decades, um, with an effort to alert uh, his fellow Jews to the reality, uh, the spiritual, existential, and political reality of the Palestinians. Uh, And that was published in Hebrew and German, Spanish, Spanish, uh, Italian, <laughs> French, etc., and Japanese even. <laughs> and at the moment, I'm writing a new introduction together with a Palestinian friend, a colleague, a, a very decent and caring Muslim. Um, he wrote a beautiful book on Palestinian poetry, Khalid Furani. Uh, and at this particular hour where things don't seem to be <laughs> on uh, the wavelength of dialogue, Khalid, my dear friend, uh, and I are writing an introduction saying, at this moment, we must re- relive, not relive, give new energy to a dialogical uh, relationship or efforts to forge 
fraternity between Jews and Arabs. And Khalid is actually a, a believing Muslims. So we'll emphasize with Palestinian Muslims and Palestinian Christians. Uh, I'll be happy to send that introduction to what you're just about to complete. Um, but it's a voice calling for or underscoring the urgency of dialogue. And if I may just say something about dialogue, is uh, I, and that it, at its heart is a fundamental difference between hearing the voice of the other and listening to the voice of the other, to the soul of all its torments and hopes, and dreams, uh, theological and religious concerns of the other, which often is not heard in the spoken word, but somehow you have to listen to uh, the heartbeat of the other, the soul. And in Jewish terms, we call it a nishoma, <laughs> which is the heartbreak. We have two words for soul in Hebrew. Uh, one is a psyche, and a nishoma is this sort of the, the vessel of our more sensible, compassionate concerns. Uh, when you say a, a very fine human being, you say he has a good nishoma, which means a, a very sensitive, compassionate soul. And another, if I would be a little bit theolog theological, we have two words in Hebrew for compassion. Compassion, uh, which is the usual word, which is shared with Islam. Um, well, I want to go for the Arabic term, but Rahman is the same word in Arabic and Hebrew, meaning the soul is derived from the Hebrew word, the, the word for the, a womb. But we have another term, and that's chemla. Chemla means compassionate love of the other. Uh, and that is at the heart, I believe, of dialogue. It's not simply an exchange of opinions. It's a way of really being attuned to the soul of the other, um, which Bubu calls the devout, uh, which suggests a more intimate engagement with the other, attention to the, to the existential, religious, spiritual, ethical reality of the other. Uh, and unfortunately, that's lacking. Um, there was an article in, the, I think, the New York Times, or perhaps it was the Washington Post recently, on the rhetoric of of, of Israelis casting the Palestinians as animals, as uh, Satan. That type of rhetoric doesn't help, and it's uh, and it, obviously I'm certain it, it's the reverse as well. Palestinians as conflict see us as as devils, whatever. <laughs> um, uh, that rhetoric it has to be suspended, has to be neutralized. Uh, it, it only blocks uh, the attentive, compassionate concern to the other as a fellow human being, as a, as a neighbor, uh, a, a neighbor whom we are to embrace with fraternity. As you as know in the, the book of, of Leviticus, we're supposed to love the neighbor, but also to love the stranger, because we know it was what it was. We Jews, the children of Israel, know what it was to be strangers, uh, treated as strangers, treated as foreigners. Um, I recently gave us, forgive me for, for chattering, but uh, a long, <laughs> that's one of the, uh, the uh, I guess, the, the faults of a professor. We, we talk too much, but uh, well, allow me just one more note. Uh, I was recently invited to give some lectures on this topic in Denmark. Uh, which was attended by friends and scholars throughout Scandinavia. And I suggested a topic of hospitality. You can, and hospitality means allowing the other person into your home, uh, not simply a, a, a formal act, but, but in the spiritual act of being a host to the other and his or her woe and joy even. Um, and dialogue is a way of really inviting the other person into your home, into your soul, and it's, of course, reciprocal. Um, and unfortunately, that's not doesn't prevail today. Uh, but we can't give up uh, our hope that somehow the seeds of dialogue will be, uh, are to be cast and be nurtured, um, such as your program, such as your, your, uh, your work at the uh, Georgetown. Uh, and I can only wish you uh, a great resonance. Of, of your, thanks, just... thanks, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Uh, you know, 
some phrases that uh, I read in, in Buber, um, they are uh, marks, guidelines, uh, beacons in my life. Uh, for me, as a religious Jew, uh, the Bible is uh, the book in which I try to discover answers for my existential questions. And uh, when I approach to the Bible uh, with this attitude, I remember some phrase that I read in one of the books of Buber, or the articles of Buber, uh, in which he says that the Bible is a book of dialogue. And this absolutely, it's a it's a very simple phrase, but it's but opens so the mind. And God said to Abraham, and Abraham said to God, and God said to Moses, and uh, so um, dialogue is the key. Is a, I used to say that uh, when there are in the place where our words will not will not be bullets in the place where you have bullets then you are not killing only the other but you are also killing the the words the 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 capability of express yourselves in the highest way uh, as human being which is using and you pronounce that in a very special way using the ne neshumo, neshama i i according I, 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 I my first language is yiddish so when you express when you pronounce the word neshama you didn't pronounce that in, in, in as in a, i i didn't understood that I didn't hear that in a Hebrew, in a modern Hebrew way, neshama, but neshuma. And that's the second thing that it was, I remained, uh, I didn't know, and uh, it's something very interesting for me, is that uh, Buber, that Buber spoke also in Yiddish. His German, I know that was uh, extraordinary, outstanding. His uh, his Hebrew, he tried, to, was outstanding. He invented a lot of words in Hebrew. I don't know whether they were accepted or not accepted by the, uh, Acad the, the, the Academy of Hebrew Language. Um, and so uh, his, other, his other languages, I suppose, are Latin and Greek that he knew very, very well. But Yiddish, uh, okay, I know. At the end, at the uh, um uh, last sentence and uh, the, the bottom sentence is that he was a Galician Jew right indeed <laughs> he was a Galician Jew now another another question that I would like to ask you related to the the, the dramatic reality we are living in um what occurs with the interfaith dialogue? What yes. occurs with the religions? Uh, religions uh, were a special issue in Boomer. I remember uh, right now it came into my memory is a, a very extraordinary article in which he makes a difference between religion and religiosity. So I translate that with that youth. I suppose that in English the good translation could be uh, religious and religiosity. I don't remember now because I originally wrote that in, in German. So Oh, <laughs> so what? What about what about what occurs? Why the religions at large mm -hmm. or the religious leaders are not uh, 
enhancing the messages for peace and not raising their voices. Yes. The distinction you uh, refer to is very central to Buber. He changed the language occasionally, but um, he saw religion um, as institutional association or affiliation, often uh, a way of defining one's identity. Um, and identity always has a problem because it's identity visa someone else. Um, and it could lead to um, estrangement or antagonism, adversarial concepts uh, or relations. Uh, religiosity points to the, the, the religious sensibilities of the other. And my own understanding of the significance of that is when I was a, a very young um, PhD, uh, I engaged in, a, in the establishment of a seminar with a Muslim, the Qadi of Jerusalem, which is the, the chief religious figure of the city of Jerusalem and the region of Jerusalem, a very fine human being, uh, Qadi Wajdi. Um, and we became very close friends. Um, but I came as an academic, and I would use words, revelation, theodicy, and all these concepts that sounds have a certain dignity in academic discourse, but really didn't register, resonate with the uh, the Qadi and the Muslims who attended. And the Qadi said to me something very, a much older man than I was at the time, said, religious dialogue is like musical appreciation. You have to listen to the, the music of the, of the, of the other. Uh, and it's not a theological debate. It's not uh, demonstrating how you, uh, your facility with theological concepts. Uh, and it's certainly nothing comparable to what in the Middle Ages was called a dispiatio, a disposition, uh, disputations, excuse me, between Jews and Christians. Um, it avoids the whole notion of supersessionism. We have the truth, you don't. Uh, we we have a more purified understanding of God's word, of the covenant. That only creates division. But music, musical appreciation, listening, as I indicated before, and I'll correct my <laughs> my my pronunciation, to the shuma of the other. The shuma. <laughs> the of the other. Um, and in terms of the history of, of Jewish religious, a Christian dialogue, which had initiation, initial moments in, in uh, Germany, one must remember Felix Mendelssohn, the grandson of the great Moses Mendelssohn, uh, who at the age of seven of his parents converted to the Lutheranism, but certainly had a Jewish background. He discovered a new Bach. Bach was forgotten, but Felix Mendelssohn, as a as a musical prodigy, listened to and as you and he lived in Leipzig, where Bach had his, uh, was the musical master or, or teacher uh, to the soul of the, the Christian liturgy as articulated in Bach's music. Um, and even those Jews who remained true to Judaism learned to understand their own spirituality to a large degree through their encounter with Christian spirituality. I was a colleague at, uh, at the University of Chicago, a Catholic theologian, one of the more preeminent uh, uh, Catholic theologians in America, David Tracy, calls the analogical imagination. I hear in you something that's very similar to my own spiritual life. Um, and that's a type of dialogue that can really be constructive uh, as opposed to a theological debate. Uh, not that theology is, of course, uh, uh, significant, but not as a point of, of debate, not as a point of supersessionism, but just listening to, to the religious voice of the other um, and hearing it echo in your own experience. You know, I forgot to, um, to add something. I didn't uh, crit criticize your... Um, your way of pronunciation of uh, of okay. Neshama, the the most important thing why I uh, said this commentary is because as Yiddish is my first language, when I hear Neshama, is uh, is another music, <laughs> <laughs> and as you said, 
it, this uh, uh, this connects me with uh, with love, with spirituality, with a uh, with something a little bit more or, or different. Not more, I would say different than when I hear neshama. Neshama is the soul that I have, but the neshama this refers me to all kind of sentiments or feelings that my mother transmitted to me, to my, uh, it sounds in a different way because this was my my first mother tongue because it was the only one tongue language that I had uh, to to speak with my grandparents and, and we used to live together. This is the music. So mm. this is my understanding when you say, when you repeat, when you the we remind the, the the words the expressions of the caddy you must hear to the music of the other um you sent to me uh, in the interchange of emails for uh, this uh, for uh, this recording uh, two articles and the one of them regarding what it's going on now in Israel, uh, you um, bring some idea, you mention uh, some very interesting idea that maybe that we can analyze together in this moment about how to understand, I suppose that this is an idea that uh, you are quoting from, from Boomer, I'm almost sure, uh, the, um, as far as I remember, that uh, it's not enough to have empathy towards the other. You have to include the other in your being. Uh, and this is great, because uh, when we analyze the... Um, when we analyze the, in, in different interfaith uh, circles for uh, in, in different circles for inter in for interfaith dialogue, we use many times the word empathy. And empathy means to put yourself in the shoes of the other, and, uh, and to understand the other, and to see the drama of the other. But this is the first step. I learned from these words that I suppose that, uh, as far as I remember, uh, you you are mentioning this as, as a, an idea, as Buber's an idea, to incorporate the other in your body. Mm -hmm. the, the other must be a part of your body. Not only that you have to understand the other, the other has to be inside you. Because all the time, this is my interpretation, what I felt when I read that, that, that the other is outside you, it's not a matter how much the empathy is. It continues being another. Right. Oh, very well uh, said. Um, indeed, Buber um, felt that empathy can only lead us to a certain degree to uh, encounter it, to understand, to feel the pain, uh, the woe, the hopes, the existential reality of the other. But uh, what we must do is learn to, and that's the challenge, is to incorporate the, the that reality of the other, let's call it the existential, irreducible reality of the other, um, in, in this dialogue with our own inner being, um, and that he calls inclusion, that we cannot negate our own pain, we cannot negate our own hopes and fears, but we can create sort of a dialogue between our inner life and the life of the other whom we wish to reach out to. Um, so you put it very well, that it's uh, a di the challenge is a dialogue within ourselves, not simply the feeling of a pain, but to... Uh, see how the other pa person's pain and hopes uh, inter in, uh, are interconnected with our own um, as a way of perhaps developing a language in which we can share uh, our, our distinctive mutual reality as a way of trying to create a, 
a, a bond to overcome uh, the divide, antagonism, antipathy, um, to recognize that we are that we are brothers, sisters, <laughs> uh, or fellow human beings, um, and that's difficult. I and Val, which is now celebrate, we're now celebrating the hundredth anniversary of the of the publication of I and Val in German. Um, if I understand it correctly, it speaks about the difficulty, the profound difficulty and challenge of developing a dialogue. It's not kind of going to have a dialogue. Um, it's a way of really making room for the other within our own life, our own fears, our own defenses. Buber speaks about us having, all of us having a defensive mechanism. He uses a German term, Manz, Panzer, which is like a, a tank. <laughs> we have w- many ways of, of protecting our own uh identities, our own inner, inner world. Um, through, uh, oh, human beings have developed a whole <laughs> a very complex strategy to avoid really encountering the other and protecting ourselves. A friend of Buber's, uh, a great psychiatrist who also is one of the great uh, founders of what we call existentialism, Carl Jaspers, said every human being is like a snail. We, we have a shell in which we hide. And as soon as the possibility of exiting that shell, and as a shadow of a threat, we move back into the shell. Uh, but we never really, the real self is within the shell. How do we exit the shell that we all have, like snails, and meet the other? Uh, and that's the challenge of dialogue. And it's difficult, certainly when there's a real political conflict. And going back to what you said be- asked me before about interfaith dialogue within Israel. It's politicized. It's clearly, we, when we meet a, Christ, a Christian, it's a Palestinian Christian. He's a Palestinian or a Muslim, Palestinian Muslim or a Palestinian or an Israeli Jew. Uh, those labels, Palestinian, Israeli, are uh, markers of the of, of a conflict, a political conflict, which is real. But how do we b- overcome those divides? How do we exit the snail the shells that we all have, the panza, if you use Buber's term, uh, and reach out to the other, um, and to be vulnerable. My own image of it is going back to the Garden of Eden, where we were nude, but not afraid. <laughs> we were open fully, not clothed with the armor of identities and political uh, strategies and in the, in the like. Um, and in some sense, then, dialogue is... Um, a way of returning to the innocence of, par- of paradise when we were not not threatened by the other. Man not by woman, uh, woman not by man, Jew not by Christian, Christian not by Jew, Palestinian not by Israeli. Um, and that's somehow almost <laughs> eschatological in the, in the dream of uh, the hope. Um, it's interesting, the conflict of the seminar I had with the with the Muslims, we call it the Hope Seminar. Um, and hope transcends the present realities. It's a way of illuminating possibilities. Um, and the possibilities, of course, of learning to to live with genuine fraternity between Jew and Christian and the like. But it's a challenge. Uh, and Buba seeks to instruct us how to develop that trust and it's not easy. I will and one one more comment, if I may. Um, the, the German is uh, poorly translated in Spanish. I think it's easier. Uh, the German has two words for two two pronouns for for the what we call the the U. There's a very formal one called Z, and it's maintained for uh, throughout most of the discourse. But then there's this, another little word, do D U. Translated do. that. Do Z. Yeah. Yeah. It's only it's used between parents and a child of closest of friends. Buba and Franz Rosenzweig were colleagues for eight years and truly worked together translating the Hebrew Bible, developing a whole program of Jewish renewal, spiritual and educational renewal. And they were per Z. After close to eight years, Rosenzweig inadvertently turned to Buba Purdue and then apologized. <laughs> and Buber responded, no, now we're ready. Now we're ready. Eight years to develop that type of trust. What is significant 
in German, and it captures what is crucial to Luber. When we turn to God, who is referred to as the king of the universe, Ribono Shalom, Melech Olam, Adon Olam, we turn to God, Purdue. God is the source of trust. The German, the Hebrew word emuna is translated interestingly by Mendelssohn and other trend with the word for trauen, trust. God is the ground of trust. God created the world, and behold, it is good, indeed very good, although we often don't experience that way. But we have to fruit our relationship to God, ground our relationship to the world and the glory of creation through trust. And that's a task of every human being. And it's a task that Buba sought to articulate. It's difficult, but we cannot surrender the effort. Um, it's very interesting uh, to, to see um, what we can learn on uh, this uh, issue about do and see in, uh, from our rabbinic teachings, or a very simple rabbinic teacher, because in Hebrew, you have not do and see this. Thing. So you use the first person, uh, ani, when you when the ani uh, would like to to uh, to uh, uh, to speak to another person, uh, so you use the second person ata. You have not do and see, but if you would like to speak with some reverence to the other, you use the third person who. Uh, and this is what we find in each blessing that we pronounce regarding right. God. Baruch Ata, bless you. Do, right. do God. Right. And afterwards, Hashem Elokeinu Melech Aulam, Asher. And afterwards, you uh, you pass to the third person. It's a mix. Right. You are close to him. But and yet we're but I don't I feel you Baruch Atah, bless you you do in German the second right. person but afterwards the reverential one the right. uh, 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 who, who he is he is uh, you pass right. to the third person um, although I was a uh, uh, what we call a pulpit rabbi, a great part of my life. And uh, uh, currently, I am a, a rabbi, of course, but devoted to academy. And this is something that we are sharing uh, in our lives. So I would like to ask you, uh, what could or should the academy do in this tragic moment in which we we see two we are witnesses of two terrible wars in uh, in, in Israel with the Palestinians in Ukraine and so many uh, so many conflicts that are projecting so many uh, threatening uh, ideas or um, so, so many uh, uh, black projections for the future. So how, what can we do? What should, I, I repeat myself, what should the, acad the academy do in this special moment in order to be a little bit more relevant than the academy was on the late 30s in Germany? We are seeing shadows coming, uh, coming to us. Uh, Black skies, skies, uh, let skies, as in Yiddish we used to say, as appears 
in the anthem of the partisans. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, what what is possible, or, or what what is the way in this tragic moment for the people related to academy? Yeah, it's a central question. As it's haunted the academy ever since we. Uh, it's been founding, and particularly within the modern world, what does what is the task of the university? What is the um, uh, the vocation of the university? There's a wonderful essay by an important essay by Max Max Weber, and it's, it's called uh, "Wissenschaft als Beruf." S scholarship as beruf can be understood as a profession, but it's also a calling, uh, a vocation, uh, and often the the professorial. Oh, excuse me, the, the professional ambition or needs uh, over, overwhelm uh, the notion of a vocation. Uh, I was raised as a young man, uh, also in a Yiddish-speaking home. Yiddish was my one of my first languages as well. <laughs> <laughs> but my parents sent me to a, a youth camp where we learned that the term career, and career is a problematic term because it means self-serving. Uh, self-ambition, where we should transcend our own ambition to reach out to the other. Uh, and that has strong Yiddish inflections for my par parents. Um, unfortunately, the academies today, the universities are governed by the notion of career, uh, of advancement, publishing or perishing, um, making an impression on one another um, in terms of language, particularly if my colleagues will for forgive me, but we often adopt a language where very few people outside the academy or outside our little circle understand. Uh, uh, and that, I think, defeats the notion of the university as a of scholarship, as a calling, a spiritual calling. So Max Weber wanted to uh, emphasize. Um, and that means it, it has to go beyond its own uh, um, uh, boundaries, if you wish. Um, and how do you do that with respecting the 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 rigor of critical thinking, and yet to be able to resonate in a way that uh, uh, that reaches beyond our limited uh, world? Um, I had discussed this with one many years ago together with a a German professor, and he alerted me to read a novel by Hermann Hesse, uh, which I think has been translated in English as. Uh, master Luna Masti, no, Louis, it's in German, it's called Glass per, Perlspiel, Perlenspiel, um, Master Ludi, I think it's can, something of that order in English. But it's, it's a, a story of an, an individual for the sake of purity withdraws from the, the harsh reality of the world into a, a monastic life and is torn by, uh, um, by the, what we may call his conscience to reach out. How to how do you maintain the purity of your soul in the ordinary sense, or even in the Yiddish sense, neshuma, and uh, and go into the marketplace, which is often deeply problematic, um, and that's a tension every individual of, that feels that he or she is bound to a spiritual calling, to how to maintain critical thought, spiritual integrity, and yet reach out to the a very fractured world uh, we call the political economic reality, where a very different ethic prevails. Um, Max Weber also spoke about what prevails in the modern world is instrumental reason, how to get the advantage of through your your economic activity, for your for your professional activity. Uh, uh, and that's often can narrow our vision, our, our sensibilities towards the the other. Um, I just finished. It, well, forgive me for put the eye, but anyway, I'll mention it. <laughs> I just finished the, writing a biography of Buber's friend Franz Rosenzweig, um, who gave up. The, he was a very career, a promising intellectual uh, academic, but he came to the conclusion that knowledge must learn be in the service of other human beings. Uh, the other human beings who have often petty questions, will seem to be petty questions. Uh, 
and he's no longer interested in, in, in addressing another scholar for footnotes and and the like. But knowledge is service. Um, so how do you re- maintain an academic uh, life and yet uh, understanding that knowledge is to serve our fellow human beings, not our <laughs> not a scientific uh, uh, journals and the like. It's important because uh, it it does maintain uh, our scholarship is is to be the rigor of of critical thinking is crucial. But how to take extend critical thinking to um, the life with our fellow human beings who may not be academics, uh, have a different language, different questions, and perhaps the the ultimate questions. Um, and now I understand, uh, after you revealed to, to me and to all of us, that uh, one of your first languages uh, was also Yiddish. Why you pronounce Neshome or Neshumo? In, uh, I live in Israel. <laughs> in, the Polish, in, in, the, in the Polish Yiddish. Now I, now I understand that. And um, going back to Yiddish, um when you uh, when you talk right, right now about the the teachings the the, ac- the academy what uh, what is the last aim of all the academic work is i remember how uh, uh, what is the the meaning the sound because yiddish has a very special each word has a, a, a very special meaning. You can say a mensch, mensch, a human being, as in German, a mensch. But when in Yiddish you hear, as I heard when I was a child, in the on quotation size, the academy of my house, when I was a, a, little, a very little child, four, five, the Darzan a mensch. You should be a mensch. And a mensch was not to be a human being. To be a human being with human values. And this is and this is what academy uh, many often forgets. Mm-hmm. To be, so. you must teach all the teachings. Ever, all the teachings. Uh, uh, um, uh, every teachings. It's not the matter, chemistry, um, physics, uh, astronomy, philosophy must in some way have the direct message or the meta message. You must be a human being. Certainly. If you are if you are a great uh, physicist. If you discover great mathematical or physical uh, uh, things and you are not a mensch, you fail. What, what is the meaning? What is the meaning of all that knowledge? Right, indeed. Um, my dear, my dear Pinchas, because I learned that this is your Hebrew name. Mm-hmm. Uh, for many years, I, I, I knew you, you as Paul. Paul, And I asked myself, Paul, what is uh, his uh, Hebrew name? And you revealed me that in one of the emails. Okay. Um, we are preparing, we are in the days of preparation for Hanukkah. In, a, in a two weeks more, three weeks more, we will light the Hanukkah candles. And the Hanukkah is a, a very special uh, festivity celebration because we remember a war, the courage of the Maccabees. But the symbol of the Hanukkah, the, the, of, uh, of the candles, uh, is a symbol of peace. The message behind the Hanukkah is what we read in the Aftara, in the shop, the, the Aftara, the, the readings from the prophets that accompanies the reading of the Torah in the Shabbat of Hanukkah, where we read from Zechariah that it's not the physical power, it's not the great armies, uh, 
לא בכוח ולא בחייל, כי אם ברוחי. But the real power is in my spirit, said, said God. So I wish you, and I also wish me, and wish all, all, all the Israelis and all the Palestinians and the whole world that the light of the, of the Hanukkah candles could uh, enlighten the vision of the rulers of the world. Of, uh, of the decision makers in order to build a world as you, me, Boober, and so many others uh, dreamt with. Thanks Amen. a lot. Amen, indeed. Thank you very much. For your time. And for and, and, and for and your I, knowledge. I echo uh, your sense, your, your Um, vision that certainly that we should um, celebrate uh, the victory of the soul in the Shoma and not of <laughs> and not of our military might um, so and it's also Thanksgiving in America and it's an opportunity to acknowledge our, our failings and the thanks and to give thanks for the possibility of overcoming those failings and Uh, and the gift of life and the gift of community. Um, and in America, of course, it's a pluralistic society. It bridges various communities, various races and religions. And that's the great blessing of America. Uh, and, the, and, this, and thus the American pop, uh, population, people, would, people should be thankful for that, the opportunity to live in a world which is truly, can I use it, a theological term from Christianity, ironic, which means that <laughs> uh, overcoming uh, uh, divisions. Um, and that's the hope of that we, Jews sh- that we as Jews share with our, our Christian and ultimately our Muslim brothers to, um, to have a world which is overcomes the vision and yet to acknowledge our differences as part of the beauty of life. Um, so. Thanks a lot and uh, I hope we we'll remain in touch now uh, after uh, this um, encounter after so many years um, and uh, let God bless us with uh, possibilities of uh, many more uh, new encounters Amen. to see and to see a world of peace of Shalom. Amen.